There are some very specific things that I look into before I buy or invest in a new piece of property, especially if I'm looking at saving tons of money and I'm looking at living inside my new investment home, which I'll talk about here in a little bit on why I almost always turn my new investment property into my primary residence. Today we're talking about the seven things to look out for that can either help you or cost you a ton of money. Now the name is Kai and I'm just a normal dude who happened to leave the day job at 27, bought some land, hand built my own home, and now I live mortgage debt free. In my free time I'm making videos and content on income generation and just money stuff that we just don't learn from schools. If that type of stuff interests you, then get started. Subscribe right here. All right, let's get into it. Slap hands, slap on fist, let's go. All right, first things first, I almost always make my new investment property my primary residence for these two key reasons. One is that the banks aren't as wary as an investment property and they give you better terms, better interest rates, not as much money up front for a down payment, that type of thing. The second reason is that in the for the federal taxes, on the back end when you sell it, if you live inside a home for at least 24 months out of the past 60 months, you don't pay taxes on any capital gains up to $250,000. Now clearly check with your tax professional and don't just believe some dude off of YouTube. Now these two advantages can save me literally tens of thousands into even maybe a hundred thousand plus over the lifetime of the investment. And then what I do next is what I call hopscotching. As I leave my previous primary residence, I turn that into a rental property. I move into my new purchase, make that my primary residence and my investment. And I live there for about a year or two. And when I'm ready, I go and purchase my next piece of property. I then shift that into my primary residence turn that current place into a rental with good terms. This leaves me a nice little trail of investment properties that all have really good terms with the banks. And if I do decide to sell them or I time it right with the market, I can sell it. And if I've lived there, I don't have to pay capital gains tax. Now, if you're a real pro or just lucky, which sometimes is better than being a professional, is that you can time it with the market to sell either at the peak or near the peak, are able to cash out without taking a huge tax hit because of that two out of five year tax law. Okay, the first thing I always look at is the number of living spaces. The key areas I'm looking for is a main living house or area, a basement, and a detached garage with an upper floor living area or potential living area. That's the ideal scenario. Essentially, if you do this right, you're basically buying a single family home that is the equivalent of a triplex, having three rental or three spaces to live in. The only thing with single family homes, you have better build quality and you can actually have a better resale value down the line. What this allows me to do is to live in one area, usually it's the main area, and I can rent out the other two. Regardless if it's short term or long term, the more areas that I have to be able to rent out, the more cash flow flexibility I have and the more income I can generate. This always either pays my entire mortgage or it gives me excess cash flows that actually provides a nice little profit as I fix up the place or take that money and reinvest it in something else. Now, one really important thing here is that very rarely am I looking for a completed home here. My ideal situation is an unfinished basement with eight foot ceilings, um, an unfinished detached garage with that upper potential living area, and then a main living home that's not too large, usually two bedrooms, two bath, around 1,500 square feet, that needs some serious updating or some TLC. You almost never want to buy a place that's already completed and in perfect shape. A lot of times you don't know how the construction was done, what was upgraded, the soundproofing, and you're paying for all those extras. I can go in and I know that I can do it for 25 to 50% of the cost or the premium that they're gonna charge me to buy a completed place. So remember, the bulk of the money that I make or that you can potentially make is actually on finding the deal on the home first. The second is the value add. What can you do when you upgrade, when you do the remodel, when you potentially have to rebuild? And then the last the third is the cash flow, which is the icing on the cake. Quick break, you know the drill. I love you all and thanks so much for the support that you've given so far. If you're liking this video so far, let's see if we can get it to 100 likes. Thanks so much. All right, let's get back into it. Now secondly, the old adage for real estate is location, location, location. Wow, that's so much easier said than actually done. 
really finding the right location has become more of an art form than a true science. I've witnessed some really dumpy locations completely blow up and turn $200,000 homes into million dollar homes over the course of five to seven years. And I've seen the opposite happen where really nice high end neighborhoods have turned into like, eh, nobody wants to live there anymore because it either got overbuilt or it just got too expensive. Now I call it a gentle art because sometimes it's better to buy a single family beat up ranch home 30, 40 minutes outside of the main city than it is to buy a nice condo in the heart of the city. What it really comes down to is cash flow and then how much money can you make on your original investment. But let's boil this down to what's really important when we're looking at location of a new property. But essentially when I'm looking at the location, I'm looking at a few key things. One is the number of companies, campuses, or potential workplaces, not only because it offers jobs in the area, but a lot of times these bigger companies, they provide income and that income obviously trickles out to the neighborhoods and the homes in that area. I typically look in a five to 10 mile radius. Next one is the school system. I don't only just see if there's local schools that are around there, but I look at the quality of the school programs and the school systems there. And I'm, sometimes I even look at the different types of schools, private schools, public schools, Montessori's, alternative type of schools. All those type of things are really taking the factor and it helps broaden the type of families, individuals, and people that may want to purchase or live or rent in that area later on. And then the next ones I look at is entertainment and ease of transportation. Nobody wants to be just in the middle of nowhere or just right next to a college campus or just next to a campus for work. They want entertainment. What I'm talking about are bars, restaurants, um, golf places, arcades, parks, hiking trails, all of those. And also within what I've noticed is the general rule of thumbs within five to 10 minutes of a major highway. Now, the really important thing here is I'm not looking at just the immediate time period of now. I'm actually looking at the growth. And if you get really good at the art and science of this is that you can project out what's gonna happen in that area in the next five to 10 years. And if you're holding on for five to 10 years, you can get in low and then obviously clearly sell in the high. And that's where I did it for two or three of my properties where I actually made it out like a bandit because I was able to time it correctly and a little bit of luck too. I'm not gonna say it's all skill, but I was able to get in relatively low and then that whole area blew up because of a new college campus or a new company campus and people flooded to that area driving my prices up. But remember, just because you choose a neighborhood that's trendy now, it may not be trendy forever. It may not be trendy even for the next five years. Now the third pitfall is really dependent on what your intentions are for the piece of property that you're trying to buy and invest in. This is hugely important because this is what we consider or what we call the silver bullet of any investment plan. You've got to check with local county codes, tax laws, and regulations in your area. Whether it's just something as simple and expensive as permitting, or it could be rental restrictions, or zoning codes, or zoning changes that you may not know of, any of these things can have a significant impact on what you do. All right, number four, the bane of my existence, HOAs, homeowners associations. Now I'm gonna to try to be nice on this one and not comment too much on the type of people and folks that I've interacted with who run and manage HOAs and the management companies that enforce them. But these sometimes are gonna be a necessary evil when there's a deal that's just too hard to pass up. However, I personally won't ever invest in an HOA ever again, unless it's like a smaller HOA that just takes care of common space or like a private road or something. But when it comes to the house itself or the property and the building itself, never again. The reason behind that is because there's a ton of regulations that they can instill. And there's a lot of political red tape, there's power struggles and there's voting and there's just all this stuff that happens where you have people having personal agendas, very similar to a government entity, that dictates what you can and cannot do with your home, all the way down to what you put out on your front porch or your deck, what you, uh, the colors that you use, um, the remodeling that you wanna do, like if you wanna change out your floors, and then especially how you wanna cash flow it. When you're dealing with multiple properties or even your first one, you just wanna avoid any headaches that aren't necessary. And HOAs are something that I believe that are unnecessary if you're trying to build out a good portfolio. Aside from the fact of the headache and the political red tape is that you can guarantee and I can promise you that you will always have your HOAs go up. 
and somebody else is managing those funds, it's not you, so you can't determine how much your HOAs will go up over time. I've seen them go up anywhere from five to 10% year over year, all the way up to, not joking, 35 to 50% in one year. So that obviously eats into your cash flow and your potential investment, and it makes it really hard to sell your condo or your place of business when HOAs are half the price of your mortgage. So something to think about. Number five, age of the house and the most recent updates. This is what my generation, the millennials, has been claiming to cause a lot of grief, is people tend to jump into a beautiful bungalow or a nice little cottage home that was built in the 1940s or even in the early 1900s. And the problem behind this is that, have you heard the saying of putting lipstick on a pig? A lot of people, flippers or whoever, the previous homeowners, they'll repaint, they'll add a room, they'll put in new floors, they might replace the windows or something, and to make the place look a lot more pleasant. But what you tend to forget is that the entire structure itself is almost 100 years old. So you're talking about the plumbing, the electrical, um, the framing, the joists, the um, doors, everything is very old. And depending on the climate and the area that you live in, you can have insect dam damage all the way to weather or water damage. And these things can really throw things off. And I have seen so many homes that are in that 60, 70, 80 year time frame that have significant issues that aren't necessarily troublesome like structural, but you walk in and there's a lot of creaking, the doors are slanted, the floor dips down quite a bit in one area, and just a little nuances that it's more of a headache. A lot of people like to call it character. I call it headaches because it's harder to work on, especially when you're trying to add fixtures, you have old electrical work done or you notice that things weren't built up to code on the front porch and you realize it after you buy it. So go into your home or go into the potential home educated. Understand how much it costs for a new roof, for new water heaters, to redo the electrical. Understand those costs in mind first. Otherwise, these things can turn around and bite you in the butt, especially if you've been living there and you've been cash flowing out and then you realize that you need to make some of these changes or upgrades. It can cost you several tens of thousands of dollars and it's a huge inconvenience because when you're doing these fixes or updates, you're probably not renting it out. So not only are you losing cash flow, but you're spending a lot more money than you were planning on. Okay, number six, timeline for cash flows and resale. This is one I rarely hear new investors or folks looking get into real estate. They don't spend enough time in this area. They'll do a rough cash flow analysis where they're like, this is how much money I'll bring in and this is how much money it's gonna cost me. But they don't really go in depth into the details and the devil is in the details. And quite often, their projections are very optimistic. Be pessimistic and see if the numbers work out. And then be pessimistic and throw in a recession and see if those numbers now work out. If you're doing this correctly, you should now be losing a few hundred dollars to maybe a couple hundred dollars each month. If you can afford your property, even the worst case scenario, then that's probably a property that you can and should buy. The second part is give yourself a timeline of when you wanna unload the property. How long do you wanna hold on to it for? Don't go into a property without an idea of when you wanna unload. This is by far the most common thing that I see is folks just buying and just saying, I'm just gonna hold and pray. Instead, prepare, buy, and then make money. You can always readjust your game plan down the line, but go into it understanding that you're gonna hold it on to three years, five years, seven years, 10 years, and explain and go through the due diligence of why you intend to hold on to something for that length of time. If obviously the economy or market changes, readjust. And the last pitfall and number seven is finding the best terms for the loan and the down payment for the piece of property. Interest rates make all the difference. So at the beginning, I mentioned why I turned my investment properties into primary residence. And a lot of it has to deal with the terms. Terms, when I say terms, it means the interest rates and what the banks want you to do in order to get the loan. The key ones are down payment, loan to value ratio, and interest rates. All three of those are not in your favor when you buy, quote unquote, an investment property. When you buy a piece of property that you don't live in and you just intend to rent out to cash flow. 
But when you make it your primary residence, you're allowed to rent it out, especially if you live on site. And primary residence loan terms are significantly better. Just monthly payment wise can save you hundreds, maybe thousands of dollars, depending on how much your home costs. And your down payment is nowhere near as significant. You can even get down as low as 3.5%. Whereas typical investments, you're looking at between 20 to potentially 40%. Now, the next thing is a little bit more advanced, I must admit, is that I take out interest only loans. I almost never have or own a 30 year fixed mortgage. And the reason why I love interest only is three things. Here in the States, we're fortunate enough to be able to write off all of our interest payments on any type of mortgage. We'll see how long that lasts. But I'm taking that to an extreme advantage. For one, I like interest only because they're usually five to seven year arms. Uh, arms are adjustable rate mortgages, look that up if you don't know what that means. But I never intend to hold on to any piece of property for 15 to 30 years. I tend, these are investment properties, I tend to hold on to them the next cycle of the market where it goes up and down, right? I wanna get to the up, sell it, unload it, take my cash out, wait for the next down, and then I can purchase and buy more property and I just keep on upgrading. Two, I don't want to pay extra into the principal of the home. And the reason behind this is that the principal payment is huge. Usually, typically my type of properties are between $500 to $1,000 a month in just principal if I did a 15 or 30 year fix. The problem with principal is that it's not tax deductible and it's like giving money to the bank that you can't touch again. I'd rather keep that money as cash. And then number two, I don't wanna pay extra money in a principal when I don't have to. With my properties, if I did do a 15, 30 year mortgage, I'm gonna be paying 500, 500 to over $1,000 plus each month just to pay the principal. Principal is not tax deductible and it doesn't really make sense for any type of investor to really put payment into principals because you already get to keep everything that appreciates over whatever value you bought the house for. And then it takes in my third thing is that with the interest rates at three to maybe four, 4.25%, I can take that cash and I can get a better return than that three and a half, four and a half percent. So it's better for me to keep that cash and re invest it in the market, in a new real estate, or even into the remodel than it is to use that cash to just pay down the mortgage. All right, a little bit more of an intermediate to advanced strategy. But with that all said, interest only loans, arms can be incredibly dangerous. It's actually what sparked and created the whole subprime mortgage blowout of 2007, 2008. I used it and I made a lot of cash and a lot of money from it. Millions of others lost everything. The problem is that people get attracted to the super low monthly mortgage payments. But what they don't understand is that that mortgage payment it only lasts for one year, three years, five years, and then it balloons up and interest rates reset. And usually they're gonna reset at a higher rate. You can see how this is a slippery slope. Now, if you like this video on the seven potential pitfalls before you buy a piece of property, then I think you're gonna like these videos right here. I'd highly encourage you to check out this video where I talk a bit more about my passive income and I go in a little bit more details about how I make passive income through real estate. And then right here, I'm gonna put another playlist of how I actually make rental income and what helped me leave my job. And then don't forget, if you haven't yet, you like this video, you can subscribe right here. I'm gonna put a little icon that you can click on to sub and see more videos on the content of making money and how to keep it. And don't forget to check in the description for cool links on getting discounts on things that I think you may be interested in, including a budget spreadsheet that I still personally use that you can get for three bucks. All right, thanks so much. I love you all. See you in the next one. Peace out.